<coughs> excuse me. Hope everybody's okay. Hi, folks. Hope everybody's okay. Love to everybody out there. And my name's Jason, and we're going to be looking at the church in the modern world. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and expounding that, God willing. So I hope it's a blessing to you. I'm tired. I've been busy preaching through the week uh, out in the streets. Um, and so if you feel sound, my voice sounds a bit uh, croaky, it's because I'm preaching regularly through the week. Uh, many, many hours of, of preaching, so quite uh, tired in the voice. <clears throat> Without further ado, it's good to be with you, good to see you, and I uh, hope you and your family are okay. And uh, don't forget my website, which is jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com, though you can look at my uh, Twitter, Facebook, and other YouTube channel. And on, on the uh, website is loads of material that you can study, courses, if you're just starting out in the faith. There's a course, a couple of courses there. There's uh, lectures on all sorts of things. There's stuff if you're an academic in terms of wanting to study theology or philosophy. There's stuff if you're just a pastor or a Christian leader, you want to grow as a leader. There's loads of stuff there. And there's loads of stuff if you're a Christian and you just want to get into the Christian faith. A um, lot of stuff uh, to look at, uh, and um, I'm also have a wide variety of interests, and so my interest, uh, theological and philosophical and historical, also uh, you can find my interest. For example, I'm interested in ancient literature such as uh, reading Philo, Josephus, and things like that. So you can find material uh, on that. I will be posting papers uh, that I've done. And other material as well that you can look at that I've done uh, in, in the next few uh, weeks and months ahead. I've got tons of stuff uh, to put up. So we're looking at uh, the church in the modern world, and so let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your love. And uh, we give you the prayers. We give you the glory today. And Father, I just pray that as we look at your word today, I pray that it would be a blessing to your people. And that, Father, you would feed them your word. That, Father, your Holy Spirit would minister to them in your name and for your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to turn to 2 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and we read these words, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You also are living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from freshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that wherein they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the prayers of them that do well. But so is the will of God, 
So is the will of God. With well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants be subject uh, to your masters with all fear, not only to do the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For well, this is a thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endured grief, suffering wrongly. For what glory is it if when we be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who do not sin, neither was guile found on his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you are a sheep going astray, but now return unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Well, folks, it's tremendous to be with you today, and it's wonderful privilege to be with you and to be able to share the word of God. I shared this message uh, yesterday at the Haywood Reform Fellowship. It's a group of people that meet for the word, and it's growing. People are coming and feeding on the word, and it's a wonderful uh, to behold to see what God is doing. And I'm just sharing this for anybody out there. Maybe one, two people might appreciate this message, and I hope it's going to be a blessing to you. So please continue to play, pray for this Haywood Reform Fellowship. Um, some of us are from a Westminster uh, Sam, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, and, uh, you know, that's where we're from. And then we have others that have come that are from a different perspective, and it's difficult to balance uh, the different views. But we, the core of us, do hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. But pray that people... We'll be united together, we'll fellowship together, we'll work together, we'll serve together in the proclamation of the gospel. So, the church in the modern world. 2013, 100 million Christians were persecuted. In 2011, 105,000 Christians were martyred. In Iran, uh, if you're a Muslim and you change to be your religion, you can have your life put to death. Um, in Europe, the Human Rights Acts have, been, have taken away Christian, right act, Christian rights. So in the midst of this pressure, um, the secular pressure, uh, which uh, our country faces, the United Kingdom and America, there is this pressure uh, on the church, and the question is, how does the church deal with it? How does the church deal with this kind of pressure? There are people who've come up with different ideas that has been the seekers friendly church um, in America where they dumb down doctrine that's been recently last few years the emergent church and they dumb down doctrine and these are different ideas that have come to deal with the pressure of modern society but if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1 it says Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius Galatia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia. You see, this was a church scattered. They were under pressure. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto prayers and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. You see, there was persecution going on. There was persecution going on. They were under pressure in this book. They were under pressure just like we are under pressure. And what that teaches us is God's word is never, ever taken by surprise. You know, Christians today in our country are wondering and frightened and, and uh, scared uh, uh, of the slow encroachment of secularism and it taking away Christian rights and the persecution that we know is going to be coming. And Christians are afraid in this country. 
But the word of God is not taken by surprise because here in this book, in the, in the Bible, it often warns us of these kinds of things happening. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of the different views, we also have another problem. Francis Chan says this, due to our consumer mindset, people are prone to jump from church to church, which weakens the church overall. There's a lot of church hopping, and a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it's based on consumerism. It's about what I can get, what I want from the church, rather than settling and getting grounded and in the Word of God uh, and, and following God's Word. Partly also it's the failure of churches to provide uh, Bible teaching uh, to people. But that is the problem. This hopping around, uh, this consumerism in churches where people are seeking things more like uh, as if they're going to a business or they're going to the supermarket, or they're going to the pictures, or they're going somewhere to consume something, and so they're hopping around. And so we're in the midst of all that, and we ask the question, how do we deal with it as Christians? How does the church deal with this culture that we're in? Well, number one, our first point, is sincerity in the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, just a, a point of notice here. If you're a preacher, if you become a preacher, or if you are a preacher, it's good to have three points. Because people can remember it, three points in your sermon. But here, we've got eight points, all right? So, but if you want to be a good preacher, use three points. But I think we'll be okay today to have eight points. Now, sincerity in the church is the first point of arresting this pressure, this confusion, and the uh, situation that we're in. If you look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says... Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. The Greek, uh, when it says laying aside, is strip off. In other words, take it off. Take this stuff that's not right off your life. Yeah? Now, notice the word hypocrisies. It's a, uh, it's a dra the Greek there has the idea of a drama. The, there's drama involved. In other words, you're putting on a mask. You're pretending to be something that you're not. And so, if we're going to be a church that arrests the situation that is going to have an impact in our society, there's got to be less backstabbing, there's got to be less striving within the church, and more harmonious, real, honest relationships within the church. And this, my friends, this it is probably one of the biggest problems within the church today, is that for all the persecution that's going around and the secularism, the house of God has to get in order. The people of God have to get right. The people of God have to get their act together. And we get our act together by being real with each other. And this is a big problem. This is a massive problem. Pastors, elders are not real with each other. Uh, people in churches are not real with each other. And we put on a mask and we pretend and we become hypocritical. We, become, we have guile where we, 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 we're speaking bad of people. We have envies. We have evil speakings, etc., and it's not good. And God will not bless a church if the people of God are not genuine and sincere with him and their fellow man. He will not bless. He will not bless. Now, if you go to verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, notice this. Wherefore, laying aside what? All malice and all gall and all all evil in other words this is something you can't play around with it's all 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 three alls there in other words get rid of it all strip it off all of it strip every ounce of any negativity any falseness in your life with other christians strip it off and be real and deep and sincere in your love for your fellow brothers and sisters in christ that will have the most powerful impact upon the secular culture than anything else. Reality amongst God's people. And then secondly, sincerity in the church, and then secondly, the word of God in the church. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You could translate it milky word or wordy milk. That's how you could translate it. In other words, this, is, this does you good. 
This nurtures you. This gives you life, spiritual life, the word of God. You know, do you remember there was a, a famine in the time of Bob Geldof when he, he did the Band-Aid? And that, that famine in Africa decimated people. It decimated societies. You know, there's a famine in the word of God today in our nation. And nations, there are people who are, who are hungry for the word and are not getting fed the word. There is a famine of the word of God in the world today. But we need the milky word. We need the wordy milk. We need the word of God to feed us, to nurture us. You know, it doesn't matter how many ideas you have for church planting. It doesn't matter how uh, great your strategies are, how great your doctrinal standards are. It doesn't matter if the word of God is not preached, the church will not grow. It's the word of God that God uses to raise up a church. If you turn to Thessal 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. One uh, Thessalonians chapter two. Sorry about this. We'll get there. Okay, we're there. One Thessalonians, <coughs> excuse me, chapter two, verse eight to thirteen. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not, not the gospel of God only, but also our souls, because you were dead uh, dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for labor night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how ho ho holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when you received, here it is, the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you. That believe. They received the word of God with meekness. And you know, that is one of the great problems of the church today, is people will not receive the word of God with meekness you know when you go to a church the word of god should be the center of the service it should it should be the center of church life you know church planting cannot happen unless the word of god is at the center it has to be at the center and this is a tragedy of our modern time it's a tragedy in many of our churches that the churches will not put the word of god at the center the, the elders and pastors should be laboring in doctrine in the word of God. If you're a pastor and an elder, your principal job, one of your principal main jobs is to pray, but also to labor in the word of God. And if you're in a church where the elders and pastors are not laboring in the word of God and, and teaching and expounding the word of God, you're going to be in trouble. A lot of pastors and preachers talk a lot about themselves rather than expound the Bible. A lot of pastors get their sermons off the internet rather than just study the Bible and get messages. A lot of charismatic pastors, and I love them, I love them to bits, will just turn up at a service and start waffling on rather than study the Word of God and expound it and teach it. The church will never ever take ground from secularism or Islam unless the church gets back to the word of God. We'll never move or arrest the tide or the times until the people of God have a hunger and respect and honor the word of God. And, and, and there is a great, great dishonor of the word of God at the present time. Many, many Christians are taking on board uh, modern ideas about about the Bible. Many, many Christians are being influenced by the ethics of society rather than studying the Word of God. Many of the young people and children are not being taught the Word of God. And we're in a crisis. And we have to get back to the Word of God. It's so important, this. It really is. This is one of the great problems of our time. 
is that the church is neglecting to study its greatest treasure, the Word of God. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. You see, they were born again by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that's the seed that you sow, and God anoints it by the Holy Spirit and brings new life into a child of God. So number one, the sincerity of the church. Number two, the word of God in the church. And number three, the roots of the church. The roots of the church. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereon also they were appointed. Here is talking about the Jews that the Jews rejected their Messiah, and because they rejected the Messiah, the Gentiles were engrafted in and were blessed with the gospel. Now there is a great, great controversy, and great, great uh, conflict going on amongst churches concerning Judaism and Christianity and the rest. But I'm not going to get into that. That's... Uh, that's not my job. My job is to expound the Bible. My job is to teach you the Word of God. That's what I'm here to do right now. But here, what it is, what it is showing us is that blessings of the Gentiles came from the Jews. And what we learn from that is that we must never forget the roots of Christianity, that Christianity came out from the Jewish people. It doesn't matter which camp you come from, whether it's covenant theology or pro-Zionism. You should all agree that Christianity came out from the Jews. And so therefore we must appreciate our heritage, our background, where we came from. If you turn to Romans 9, Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, 30, it says this, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the Lord of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Israel stumbled at the message of Christ because they tried to establish their own righteousness. Romans 10, 1 to 4, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God and not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's reinforcing what I've just said. But then if you look at uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 7. What then? Israel had not obtained that which they seek for, but the election had obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Even though the people of Israel rejected the gospel, rejected Christ, there were, there were a remnant of Jews that did accept Christ. Then it goes on in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So this blessing that's come to the Gentiles is to also stimulate the Jews to jealousy to want to know Christ. Then if you turn to Romans 11, 12, uh, 25, it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. There is a fullness of the Gentiles, and then the Jews who were rejected because of their unbelief will be brought back 
into fellowship with Christ. And then Romans 11.31, Even so, have these also now not believed, that through your mercy also they may obtain mercy. In other words, the Jews will come back to the Messiah and come to know him. There will be a revival. There will be an engrafting of the Jewish people into the kingdom. So what does this all mean? It, what it means is this, is when secularism is moving in on us, when the persecution is coming, we need to realize history is moving to God's drumbeat. That the Jews, for some mysterious way, are important in the historical flow of history. And that one day they'll be engrafted in into the church. And that we should be encouraged to see God at work in history, where he is fulfilling his promises to his people. We should appreciate the great blessings that the church has from the Jewish people. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say anything more, but that's what the Word of God says very, very clearly. Um, very, very clearly it, it states that. Now, like I said, I, 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 I'm conscious of my brothers and sisters on either camp, so I'm not going to say anything more. Um. I'm tempted to, but I'm not going to, because I want to stick to the Word of God. It's what the Word of God says. And, and, and that is what the Word of God says. And we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged to see God at work in history. And history, you know, the center of history is not Islam. The center of history is the church, the, what God is doing in the church, and the engrafting in of his people. Excuse me. I'll, I'll answer it in a bit. And the engrafting in of his people. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious I don't want to cause any division amongst God's people. I just want to teach the Bible as the Word of God. and The stumbling here, the, the stone, a rock of offense, they were, the Jews were offended at the Messiah. And we just looked at Scripture that expounds that passage uh, in, in its fullness in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And we should take great encouragement to see history is moving to the drumbeat of God. And this issue of the engrafting in of the Jews, the rejection of the Jews, the engrafting in of the Jews, and the blessing of the Gentiles, and all the rest. If you read Romans 9, 10, 11, there are three grand issues that come out of those passages. One, uh, the goodness and severity of God. Two, election. And three, Christ. And in these discussions, those three things should be at the center of every discussion. Election, the goodness and severity of God, and Christ. And we shouldn't be getting bogged down with arguments about Israel and, or non-Israel or and all this. When you read Romans 9, 10, 11, that is what he's trying to teach us about the engrafting in of the Jews, these great lessons of the goodness and severity of God, the election of God, and Christ is center of his people. I'm just going to get some more water. Okay, just one minute. Just give me a minute. All right. Excuse me. Forgive me.
me. So next, the high calling of the church. Imagine a boy goes to school and uh, he's bullied by his classmates. He's, he's nine years of age and he comes home and his parents tell him, you don't feel bullied. You are special. You are important. You're just as good as anybody else. You go to school with your head up high. Don't let anybody pull you down. Well, secular culture is pulling us down as a church, and we need to rem remember our high, our high calling as a church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So it says we are a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a priesthood. Priesthood has access to God, a priest has access to God, a priest can serve God, and a priest is royal. We have authority. When, we're in, when we come to know God, we are a royal priesthood, my friends. We are a royal priesthood. There are many scriptures that talk about the dignity of the church. We ha the church is a flock in John chapter 10, verse 16. The church is a vine, John 15, 5. The church is a bride, Ephesians 5, 27. The church is a body, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 15. The church is a family, Romans 8, verse 15, 17. You see, all these things about the church, a flock, a vine, a bride, a body, excuse me, a family. So, excuse me, study these scriptures when you get time on your own. But if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you also, as living stones, are built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, by Jesus Christ. He says you are living as living stones. There's a story of a king who heard about the, wall, the stones on the wall of the walls of the king of Sparta. And how magnificent these stones are. So the king went to visit the king of Sparta. He gets there and he finds no walls. He finds no stones. And he goes to the king of the Sparta. You know, what's this? There's no stones. There's no walls. And the king of Sparta turned to his army and he said, each one of them are our stones. And that's true of you and me. We are, in the church of God, the stones uh, that are built on the major stone, foundation stone of Christ. We are the stones and we're to stand together. We're to serve together. We're to fight together for the gospel. In fitting together in rank, a holy people serving God. And, and when secularism and the church is being persecuted, let us remember our high calling. We are the people of God. And we must not be ashamed to own his name, the great and living God who is over all. Number five, the holiness of the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from flesh, fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that wherein they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Which uh, abstain from fleshly lusts. The idea there is not just sexual sin, but it's all the, the, the fleshly desires that we might have. It's kind of akin to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do these things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulence, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, and have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. The holiness of the church. The church is never going to be blessed unless we individually walk in a holy way. The church is never going to be blessed if it compromises on sound doctrine, on ethics, and holiness in the Christian life. You know, there was cursing and blessings for Israel. If they were obedient, they would be blessed. If they were disobedient, they would be cursed. And there would be no battle won. There would be no victory. There would be no blessing unless there was holiness in the camp of God. And we might have our confessions of faith. We might have our charismatic meetings where we're jumping up and down, banging on drums. We might have our social outreach uh, work and whatever. But if the people of God are not living a holy life, it will come to nothing. You see, the church of God has to be a holy people. It has to want to be a holy people, walk in a holy way, live in a holy way, to, to not get contaminated. But, you know, we do get contaminated. Things do come in in the world, on the television, on the radio, on music or whatever. These things subtly come in and pervert our minds and change our minds so our minds are not focused on the living God, but we have been taken captive by the seeds of the devil rather than the word of God. Be ye holy, for I am holy, says God. The church needs to be a, a church that is holy. And there are movements now that are trying to bring in these various ethics that have nothing to do with what the Bible says. And trying to bring it in with a Trojan horse. Trying to bring it in. You know, one of the ways is... You know, I'm gay, but I'm not practicing, but I'm a Christian. No, that, that's wrong. It's wrong because no Christian says that. A Christian says, I'm a new creature in Christ. Old has passed away and all things have become new. That's what a Christian says. I am a new creature in Christ. You don't define yourself by your old life. I don't say I'm a bank robber, but not practicing anymore. I don't say uh, I, I'm a shop. I'm a shoplifter, but I'm not practicing anymore. No, you are a new creature in Christ. That is your identity. That is your way of, of looking at yourself now. So we can bring in things that are not right from the back door because we're not following exactly what the Bible's teaching about we, who we are in Christ. The church will never prosper. The church will never, ever go forward in this land or any other land unless the people of God be holy unless we be holy unless we be right unless we be true we're never going to be blessed now that i don't want you to be a pharisee i don't want you to go around pointing the finger at everybody saying oh you're a dirty sinner you're a horrible sinner you, you you you're gay or this and that i don't want you to do that because that's not right that's not loving but what it what is loving is to stick to the bible stick to truth and when the Bible says something is true, is to teach it, preach it, and live it, that is a loving thing to do. That is showing people what is the right way to live and to teach it, to not tell people what the Bible says on these ethical issues and to call people to repentance and to believe in Jesus is a great, great sin in God's eyes because you're rewriting the Bible according to modern culture rather than listen to the Bible to speak in these modern times. And my friends, the Christians today, many Christians today, don't like what the Bible says. So they're changing the morality, following secular morality, in order to fit their secular views into Christianity. Rather than allowing the Bible to teach us how to live, and then we go and live it. 
because we don't want to live it because it costs too much or we're seen as irrelevant or we're seen as bigoted or narrow-minded. But it doesn't matter how people see us. It's whether we're honest to God's word and to God himself and faithful to his word and obey it in our lives. Come what may to the law and to the testimony, to the word of God and obey it. And if, it's in, if we're unpopular, it doesn't matter. We must be holy before God if we're going to get blessed in this land or any other land, my friends. Number six, submission of the church. We've looked at sincerity of the church, the word of God in the church, the roots of the church, the high calling of the church, and the holiness of the church, and then submission of the church. Sorry about this. Submission of the church. Uh, if we turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors and unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the prayers of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with, with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness but as the servants of God. It says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. There's no room in the Christian life for hero seekers. But the Bible teaches that at all times we're to be submissive to governments in terms of we should have a humble attitude, a submissive attitude to the authorities. When the pressure comes upon us, and our secular culture, there will be temptations of individuals who want to step out, make a name for themselves and say, look, I'm standing up at the times, I'm standing up at the secular culture or whatever. But we must be very, very careful because the scriptures clearly teaches that we must, uh, as much as we can, even if we're being unjustly treated, treat them with dignity and respect uh, uh, the authorities. Now in Matthew chapter 22, 21, it says, Render unto Caesar that is Caesar, says the Lord. In other words, give respect to the authorities that are due. And 1, Peter 2, uh, 1 Timothy 2 verse 2 talks about we must pray for those in government. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we have to obey everything all the time. There are times when we can go against the government, uh, and it's when... We're either told to sin or we're told to stop preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 4, verse 19, it says we obey God rather than men. In Acts 5, 29, it says the same. When they tried to stop the people of God preaching, Peter said, you know, we follow God, not, not men. But generally speaking, the scriptures clearly teach as much as we can and as far as we can, we must, even if we're treated unjustly, be submissive to the government and we'll be blessed in a secular society if we do that because the society will see how gracious and loving and caring we are with the secular people seven the suffering of the church 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 for what glory is it if when you buffet it for your faults you shall take it perfectly. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. One thing that will happen to you is you will suffer in the Christian life. You will. So just get used to it. It's going to happen. There's a story of Campbell Morgan and his wife going to hear a young preacher. And uh, she was raving about this young preacher, saying what a great preacher he is. But Campbell Morgan wouldn't say anything. Sometime later, they went to see him again, and he looked as if he'd really been battered and struggled, this young preacher, and gone through difficult times. And coming home, his wife was excited but didn't want to say anything because her husband didn't say anything before. And then he turned around, he said, now he's a great preacher. He's a great preacher because he'd experienced suffering, you see. You know, we, 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 we can preach things, we can say things, but are we... Have we experienced it ourselves? Do we really know it ourselves? 
can we say that we actually know these things for ourselves? It's all right to talk about things theoretically, but if you're lying on a bed, hospital bed, or you're lying on those situations like that, that's when you know that there is a God, that God is meeting your need, that God is there with you, you know. So be careful not to, to, to talk to people in a trite way, you know. You know, when people are suffering and you go and you talk to them and say, oh, uh, you know, God is with you, God is here, God will do this, God will do that. But you yourself have not suffered, so you're not really compassionate. You don't really know how they are going through that situation. So be careful. But we're going to be persecuted. We must realize this. We must get our minds around this, that if you're a Christian, you will have persecution come your way, and it will be difficult at times. But keep showing love in that situation. John chapter 15, verse 20. Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 20. John 15, verse 20. It says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is, is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my, my saying, they will keep yours also. In other words, they persecuted the Lord, they'll persecute you. So don't be surprised when persecution comes. We're near the end. Last point. The shepherd and the church. The shepherd and the church. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Chapter 2 verse 21. For even whereinto you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to, to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye uh, were healed. Christ is, is there at the center, you see. We see his example. You know, we see his example here that he suffered, and that is to be our example. We see that he died on a cross, that he shed his blood on a cross for our sin. You know, the church is not preaching the cross as much as it should. Uh, we should be Christ-centered in our preaching. Christ should be at the center of his church. It is his church. If you turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entered not the, by the door in the sheepfold, but climbeth up the other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the sheep, shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them. And he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd of his church. It is his church, not my church, not your church, but his church. So we shouldn't tamper with it. We shouldn't tamper with the church. We should recognize that it's Christ's church. You know, there was a story of a woman who was arguing in the church for different uh, wallpaper in the church. One person wanted one kind of wallpaper, another person wanted another kind of wallpaper, and they were arguing, and one person got upset and was crying. The question shouldn't be, what kind of a wallpaper, type of wallpaper should we have in the church? And I will fight to tooth and nail to get my view in that. It should be, what does the Lord want in this situation? What is the best for the Lord in this situation? Does it bring him glory and honor in this situation? You see, Christ is the head of the church. And that should encourage us that when there is persecution and secularism arises and gets worse and worse, it's not our problem, it's the Lord's. It's his church. He will protect it, defend it, and help it, and strengthen it in these evil times. He's above all this that's going on in the nations. And he knows his people. He loves his people. And he will look after his people at this present time. So we've come to the end now and the conclusion. 
if you turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, love the brotherhood. There is to be a love amongst us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, the truth's really important, central, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. We have to have this love. And then if you turn to John, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, 1 Peter 3, verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one another. Here it is, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. It says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you, all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have that charity, have that love for one another. You see, the greatest defense against secularism is a people that love each other unconditionally when the world when secularism when people see that we have a love for each other that is unconditional the world will sit up and listen when it sees such love and in the early church of peter they had that commitment and love to one another so we've come to the end and let's just recap what we've learned today we've looked at the church in the modern world We've looked at the importance of sincerity, strip off all that's not right. We've looked at the word of God in the church. The church should desire the sincere milk of the word or milky word or wordy milk as it's translated in Greek. Third, the church should remember its roots, that we came out of, we came out of Jew, Judaism and the Jews are going to be engrafted in to, to, to us. Uh, there's going to be a revival one day. Four. The high calling of the church. The church it is, is a flock, a vine, a bride, a body, a family. It is stones, spiritual stones. These are the great privileges of the church. And we must not be intimidated or browbeaten by a secular age or any, any other movement that would try to take us down. Fifthly, the, the holiness of the church. We should be a, a people that walk in a holy way, submitting to the word of God, not secular culture. Six, the submission of the church. We should be a humble people walking humbly before a secular society. Seven, the suffering of the church. We will be persecuted falsely by the secular outfits of today. And eight, the shepherd of the church. The Lord is looking after his church. So let's not be discouraged. He's taking care of the church and he will raise up a standard in these last days. I hope that's been a blessing to you. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com. I ask you for prayer. Pray that God will continue to bless uh, the preaching of the, the word in the city centers. I pray that God, uh, God will bless the, uh, the fellowship that we're doing, uh, Haywood Reform Fellowship, and that it would grow, that it could be a church plant, that we could move into doing other church plants as well. Um, around the city and other places as well. Uh, so God is, is really blessing us and, he, and he's really with us. And But the persecution, the, the opposition of the enemy is growing because we're moving and getting the gospel to the people. So we need your prayers. We need your support. Uh, and we need your encouragement uh, in these days. So please pray for us, whoever you are today. Put me on your prayer list daily. Please put me on your prayer list daily. So that, so that um, you know, because this work of sharing the gospel cannot be done on on our own. We need each other. We need support. So, you know, I'm asking for prayer. Whether you're charismatic, we most of us, or good core of us, are reformed. Um, hold to the reform confessions and things. Uh, some of us are evangelical, general evangelical. But, you know, whether you're charismatic, whether you're reformed, whether you're Arminian, whether, whatever you are, so long as you know the Lord and the basics of the Christian faith, we would ask you to pray for us that the gospel would go forth 
and that we would reach out and and that we would shepherd people in the word of God. Um, we need your support. We need your prayers. We really, really do. God is really blessing. It's tremendous what's happening. There is some something stirring. God is moving. And it's a tremendous encouragement. It really is. We're having such wonderful, wonderful meetings. I'm not just saying it, but they're the best meetings I've ever been to for years. There's a real sense of God's presence, a real sense of fellowship of God's people, a real unity and a real a real sense of getting into the meat of the word and and, and a, a real blessing for each other and a support of each other. And it's just tremendous, really. I'm so thrilled to be part of what's happening here. Uh, so that is because of your prayers. That is because some of you are praying. And I, I tell everybody what we're doing. I text everybody. And, and lots of people are praying. And I, and I ask that you would continue that prayer every day. We need your prayers because you, you, you God is blessing us so much because of your prayers all right let's pray and may god bless you and keep in touch you can keep in contact with me uh through the website jasonbirdspreacher.com so thank you so much and uh god bless you and have a lovely day let's pray father we thank you for this day we thank you for your blessings we thank you for your grace we thank you for your goodness and father i just pray that you would be with us and that you would help us and that you would give us strength. Be with my brothers and sisters today. Bless them. Encourage them wherever they are in their walk with you. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm going on my other YouTube channel now. I'm going to make a couple of videos there if you want to go. You can get to my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, and find the other YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and I'm going to put uh, one or two things on Twitter and Facebook, so. God bless you. Have a lovely day. It's good to be with you. God is good. Um, yeah, if I, I would encourage you to study 1 Peter. Uh, have a look at uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on his sermons on 1 Peter. You find them a blessing. All right, thank you for listening, and God bless you.